Welcome everyone to the Ascend X webinar on maximizing payload success. And now your moderator for today, Dan Dumbacher. Hello everyone, greetings. I'm Dan Dumbacher, the Executive Director of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Thank you for joining us today for this special webinar to help you get your payloads off the ground and into orbit. Opportunities to pursue discoveries in our off-world universe are expanding and payload capacities and budgets can be limiting, especially if you're not sure how to navigate the space. At Ascend, our goal is to engage and enable partnerships to help build our off-world future faster. So let's get to it. During the first hour of our time together today, we will hear from two of America's foremost experts on payload project planning and operations. Ms. Jen Gustetic is NASA's first director of early stage innovations and partnerships, and Dr. Alan Stern is a planetary scientist and head of NASA's New Horizons mission, as well as associate vice president for the Southwest Research Institute. Our remaining time will be your chance to interact with each other and with leading companies in the space payloads industry, such as Maston Space Systems. You'll be able to reflect on what you've learned today and share your path forward with others. Now, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Jen Gustetic is an experienced innovation leader in the federal government and a policy entrepreneur. Throughout her career, she's led numerous innovative communities focused on incentive prizes, citizen science, design thinking, and the maker movement. In her current role with NASA's Space Technology Mission Directorate, she leads a portfolio of technology programs that engages diverse sources and creativity and innovation across the country. She awards more than $300 million in funding annually through several methods. These include prize competitions, the Small Business Innovation Research Program, or SBIRs, and the Small Business Technology Transfer Program, among others. Jen also serves as the co-chair of the Partnership for Public Services Innovation Council. Outside of her government duties, she serves on the Board of Trustees for the Van Allen Institute, as well as the Board of Advisors for the National Science Policy Network. Previously, Jen worked at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy as the Assistant Director for Open Innovation. Jen holds a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering from the University of Florida and a master's degree in technology policy from MIT. She also was a Future of Work Research Fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School and received an, ex an executive education certificate from Stanford University in venture capital investing. If you have any questions for Jen, please use the chat feature and we will answer as many as we have time for after her presentation. Jen, we're all ready and the floor is yours. Thank you much, uh, very much, Dan. Um, hi folks, as Dan said, I'm Jen Gustetic and I'm uh, STMD's first director for early stage innovations and partnerships at NASA. I'm happy to be here today to talk about how entrepreneurs, businesses, students, and others can navigate opportunities to develop and fly payloads on their path towards commercialization. Next slide. In STMD, we seek to advance technologies and talent that lead the world both not only for infusion in breakthrough NASA missions, uh, next click, as well as for broader commercialization and economic impact. And our impact is felt not only in the space economy, but also in consumer goods, health and medicine, public safety, and other spinoffs. Next click. To do this, we embrace the capabilities that make STMD unique for NASA which includes using all the tools at our disposal to source ideas from a diverse, broad base of innovators across the country, to transition technologies to the valley of death, and ultimately to transfer those technologies into the space economy. We understand that this process takes time and it often isn't linear. Many great ideas, in fact, face death numerous times before they become breakthroughs. It takes persistence and innovation to achieve ultimate impact. Next click. We also understand that we are part of a broader ecosystem. STMD is an important part of seeding the US space economy alongside our commercial, academic, and other government agency partners, where just as technology development isn't linear, it also doesn't happen in a vacuum, though testing might. Next slide. One example of this engine is the rollout solar array technology developed by deployable space systems. 
This is a story of technology development, company growth, and the many parts of the ecosystem that contributed to this impact, both from STMD as well as other NASA programs like the ISS, other government agencies like the Air Force, and commercial partners and investors such as Maxar and Redwire. It also highlights the role STMD plays in seeding and de-risking technology at key parts of this story. Founded in 2008, this particular example is the story of a 13-year journey from idea to deployment. As I said, it doesn't happen overnight. This technology was initially de-risked through SBIR awards, including phase ones, twos, post-phase throughs, and threes, starting in 2009. It, the technology was further advanced in other STMD programs, like the Game Changing Development Program and Technology Demonstration Mission Program, such an investment and investment uh, that, that culminated in 2014 with a 20 kilowatt ground demonstration of the technology. But other government agencies like AFRL also played an important role on this particular technology's journey. AFRL supported an in-space demonstration on the ISS in 2017. And since then, DSS has continued to leverage both STMD funds and private sector matching funds to continue to refine this technology. So that leads us to today, to 2021. This year, the company has had two large milestones demonstrating the various outcomes that STMD is seeking to advance for the country. Later this year, the ISS will upgrade their solar panels with the DSS technology and a series of spacewalks. In fact, Crew 2's crew is scheduled to begin preparations for supplementing the station's existing rigid panels this summer with the first pair of six new arrays. Maxar has also partnered with DSS on parts of the power and propulsion element for the gateway, a key part of the Artemis strategy. Additionally, earlier this year, DSS was acquired by Redwire, which is also pursuing an IPO this year, an initial public offering. This is a powerful example of the time space technology can take to develop, but also to find markets. It is also a powerful example of the multiple STMD programs that aid awardees and technologies through their winding journeys. Next slide. And you can just go ahead and click through these until you get to the TDM dot that will be on the bottom. And ROSA, what I just described, isn't the only example. At least 13 STMD supported technologies are now on board the Mars Perseverance rover on the surface of Mars today. Not all of these ideas not all, not all ideas transition to infusion or commercialization, as I noted before, but many game-changing technologies and the teams that support those innovations do, and it enables the U.S. to be a global leader in space technology. Next slide. As I described earlier, STMD works with innovators from across the space tech ecosystem in both traditional and non-traditional ways through a variety of programs that you can see it in front of you. We have various opportunities to on-ramp technology projects and to continue the development of those technologies and teams. For example, the early stage innovation and partnerships portfolio that I oversee um, is comprised of the programs that you see in blue, red, and orange, the stuff to the center and the left of the screen in front of you. These programs engage academic researchers, small businesses, large businesses, entrepreneurs, internal researchers, and individual innovators in technology development. We encourage awardees as early as possible to think about flight demonstrations in various different ways since it can accelerate their technology development efforts. Many of our programs also have ties with the downstream uh, technology development programs, Tech Mat and Tech Demos that you also see on this slide, in order to create pathways to flight demonstrations. But there are also other paths outside of STMD, like through the International Space Station, CASIS, Rideshare, and the CLIPS program, some of which I'll talk about today. Today, I'll mostly be focusing on the opportunities offered by Space Tech, um, but also some of the stories uh, to get you excited about the multiple different winding paths that teams can take to infusion and commercialization success. Next slide. So the first story or program I really wanna start with today is the Space Tech Research Grants Program. This particular program with an STMD engages the spectrum of academic researchers on early stage technologies all across the country through almost 800 awards to date. Uh, this program funds a wide variety of technology research areas, including robotics and autonomous systems, science instruments and sensor systems, materials, structures and manufacturing, you name it. Pretty much any technology that NASA is interested in, uh, in terms of an early stage innovation standpoint, STRG is investing in those types of topic areas. It's a really important on-ramp and continuation path for early stage university research. I highlight this program because it's developing innovative technologies that could not only be the seed born for the next great startup, 
but also that STRG can be a path to develop technologies destined for payload and flight opportunities. I'll give you one example. Um, an image which you can probably see very, very small in the top um, right-hand corner of this slide um, was a collaboration with the Stanford Autonomous Systems Lab and the Intelligent Robotics Group at NASA Ames, which sought to equip assistive free flyers, which are small robots aboard the International Space Station, with gecko-inspired gripper appendages to aid astronauts. A four-tile gecko gripper for Astrobee free flyers launched this summer in 2019 and actually just this month underwent testing aboard the ISS. Next slide. The next program that I wanna highlight for you all targets a slightly different audience, small businesses, but also some research institutions because research institutions can partner with SBIR companies in the STTR portion of this program, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But SBIR is really a super important on-ramp for small businesses and entrepreneurs into the NASA ecosystem. This program has been around for about 38 years, uh, furthering relevant research and building capabilities for NASA, the commercial aerospace industry, and the nation as a whole. And this program specifically deploys nearly $200 million a year, 200 million a year in non-dilutive funding to small businesses and entrepreneurs to de-risk their technologies. It's a large source of seed funding for small businesses and entrepreneurs. And while NASA isn't the only agency to have SBIR funding, we do uh, focus on aerospace relevant topics within our um, SBIR and STTR programs, as do agencies, however, like the Air Force and the NSF, who also have space relevant content. We coordinate with those different agencies also to think how we might um, uh, enable the best experience and on-ramp on opportunity uh, for uh, entrepreneurs related to space across the country. So even though this program technically falls under the Space Technology Mission Directorate, this program does serve everything NASA does. And so there are, air, there are aeronautics um, opportunities through this particular program, as well as human exploration, science, and space technology advancement. Um, also, interestingly, um, one of the topics that's been part of the SBIR program since 2010 has actually been a subtopic that's been focused on uh, a pretty broad uh, a pretty broad pro problem statement, which is tell us how you would leverage ISS uh, to encourage ISS utilization. And so some companies actually got their first step in to NASA thinking about how they might develop technologies that could benefit from or utilize the ISS. In fact, some of the early maiden space investments uh, kind of came in through that subtopic of the SBIR program as they were seeking to build things like the additive manufacturing facility for space. This particular subtopic in SBIR has led to a number of flight experiments um, that, uh, that also put other dollars to work uh, when ISS funding, as well as other uh, matching funding comes to the table to help make those flight demonstrations a reality. Next slide. But we know in the NASA SBIR program, for example, typically a single 125K phase one and a single 750K phase two award is just not enough to go along that journey that I described earlier, for example, that DSS went through with the ROSA solar array. In fact, that particular company had dozens of SBIR awards over the years in order to de-risk and develop the various components and portions of their technologies. And so we've created actually a number of different continuation opportunities that we call post phase two opportunities through the SBIR program that allows uh, kind of more resources and in fact, more than just funding to help companies through their commercialization journey. One example of that is the i program that you'll see highlighted in yellow on this slide. i is essentially a program which provides business assistance and training to our small businesses. Um, it, it kind of helps you if any of you have read um, Lean Launchpad or kind of Lean Startup uh, methodologies of thinking about finding product market fit, um, not just developing the technology, but also understanding who your customer is. This training program really puts you through a rigorous process of in, uh, interviewing dozens of potential customers to help you understand how to talk to customers and uh, do customer discovery activities to really figure out how to identify that customer market uh, fit. And many, many of the SBIR companies participating in this program have taken advantage of that training to help improve their commercialization strategies. Another example are the higher dollar value awards that we'll actually make later after a phase two is complete. Um, for example, a phase two sequential um, program that we recently just uh, started last year to accelerate technologies on the way um, that are aligned with the moon to Mars objectives. 
Last year, we actually selected seven small businesses to receive a total of $29 million um, for up to $5 million per project uh, to, to mature a range of technologies for sustainable expo exploration of the moon under the Artemis program. And so that's a really important pipeline to get into if you're a small business or an entrepreneur when you think about all of the ways that you can continue the development of your technology through subsequent investments through the SBIR program. Two other things I'll note about SBIR. One, SBIR phase threes are a super critically important opportunity if you're seeking to potentially sell your solution to the government someday. So there's a little known fact about the SBIR program, but that phase three awards are essentially sole source awards that as long as you've won a phase one for your technology, a Anyone in government, not just at NASA, anybody in the government can make a sole source phase three SBIR award to you building on that phase one award because you've already satisfied the requirements for competition having won a phase one award in the government. Um, that's a huge advantage to small businesses and entrepreneurs when they use that as a license to hunt for business development across the government. So one thing I want to point out to folks thinking about how to um, access government work. Um, the, the second thing I la or the second the last thing I wanted to acknowledge on this slide was that um, since we're here at a payloads work workshop is talking about flight opportunities. Um, in these post phase two opportunities that you see on this slide that require matching funding, so dollar for dollar SBIR will fund along with a matching funder. The NASA Flight Opportunities Program, that's actually another program within Space Tech that I'll talk about in a moment, will actually be that matching funder if what you're seeking to do through that project is to undergo a flight uh, demonstration or a flight opportunity. And so there are instructions on the website about how to actually approach the Flight Opportunities Program about being your matching funder, if that's what you seek to do in your post phase two uh, uh, activity. So I just wanna give you one success story on the next slide related to SBIR. Um, uh, I'd already mentioned DSS, which is an SBIR um, alum company. I'd mentioned Maiden Space, which is an SBIR alum company. TechShot is another um, interesting um, story um, that has worked with the SBIR program over many years and uh, has had a, a recent really, really interesting success story as well. Um, they're actually the first U.S. company to 3D print organic constructs on the International Space Station. The company's biofabrication facility, um, that they call BFF for short, because everyone loves a good acronym, prints in space to overcome the effects of gravities on Earth, which can actually cause 3D printed tissues to deform under their own weight. So in, in July 2019, in order to test this um, in space, TechShot launched its biofabrication facility uh, to the ISS on a SpaceX Dragon launch. Um, this is really um, enabling in a number of different ways, as I'm sure that you can imagine. And in fact, this was actually enabled, this particular demonstration was enabled through one of the post phase two awards I mentioned on the previous slide, uh, a CCRPP, which is a, a, a particular investment that will uh, match dollar for dollar up to $3 million. So for a total of a $6 million project. Um, this uh, particular activity was actually um, uh, supported through a CCRPP award um, where the uh, matching funding came from the ISS program. Next slide. Just one other thing to point out about TechShot is that, um, and one of the strengths of the SBIR program is that it's really geographically neutral, right? A lot of venture capital and other sources of funding around the country um, flow to certain areas or certain hotspots uh, within the country. And the SBIR program really does seek to uh, enable a diverse uh, set of participants in the space technology ecosystem. And TechShot as a company has experienced that, specifically testifying that, our, uh, that their company has been able to provide jobs in a rural area in a non-space state. And they really tie that back to the SBIR program and the availability of those funds broadly across the country. Next slide. Another method that um, I used to also run in a former life, the Prizes and Challenges program, I just love open innovation and prizes and challenges as a way to engage individuals and innovators across the country. Um, this is another method uh, that Space Tech uses in order to engage entrepreneurs and early stage innovators in technology development. As many of you would imagine, traditional government procurement, as well as grant making, often requires companies or researchers to submit proposals for evaluation, and then work is funded through grants or contracts. What's different about prizes is that instead of submitting a proposal that uh, plans for how you might do some work, prize competitions typically take the diff a different approach. They specify a problem and then they pay for performance. So they make an award, make a payment based on who is able to actually achieve the goal 
associated with, a, with the prize activity. And it's also a way where we can work with individual people. So you don't have to work for a company or an organization or a university to actually work with the government in this way. Individual winners that win prize competitions get direct EFT payments from the government for winning a particular prize competition. So it's a way to actually reach all the way, all the way to individual members of the public, not necessarily through organizations. NASA hosts and runs a ton of prize competitions every year, and you can find those on the NASA prize website, which is NASA Solve. Um, and prizes and challenges actually do uh, sometimes lead to flight opportunities. So if you go to the next slide, uh, one recent example of a really cool prize competition focused on payloads um, uh, is, is listed here. Um, the technology maturation program with an STMD actually issued two challenges recently. Uh, one was conducted to our internal workforce population and the other one was conducted externally um, that uh, sought to develop miniaturized payloads, hence Honey, I Shrunk the NASA payload, to be sent to the moon in the next one to four years and bridge lunar strategic knowledge gaps. The Honey, I Shrunk the Payload Challenge is a global challenge. It's been executed by our partner Hero, Hero X, and it received 132 submissions from 29 countries for the first phase. Uh, the Be the Game Changer internal challenge that focused on our internal community um, gave the opportunity for NASA teams to also submit proposals, and it received eight submissions from five of the NASA centers. These payloads um, basically have to be in similar in size to a bar of soap and we'll continue a pipeline of next generation instruments, sensors, and experiments that can be used for lunar exploration over the next several years on early uncrewed lunar demonstrations, such as the Cooperative Autonomous Distributed Robotics Explorers, CADRE, <laughs> or Cold Operable Deployable Arm, Cold Arm. After testing and evaluation of these four received prototypes, one winner will receive a $100,000 prize, and one runner up will receive a $25,000 prize. NASA then plans to test one or two prototypes to failure and reserve the remaining ones for possible deployment, including potentially on an upcoming CLIPS payload opportunity. Next slide. So I wanna talk very quickly about uh, uh, kind of three other opportunities for payloads. First, the Flight Opportunities payload uh, Program, second, ISS, and finally CLIPS before I close. Um, the Flight Opportunities Program um, is really about making suborbital flight testing available that can be an important stepping stone to realize some of the infusion and commercialization success stories I described previously. They can be important to evaluation performance, obtaining data, and refining experiments. And NASA provides a few funding opportunities through STMD's Flight Opportunities Program um, through both the tech flight solicitation as well as the matching funding that I described earlier for SBIR companies through the post phase two pipeline in SBIR. Next slide. And we support a lot of flight opportunities. Uh, we've enabled 692 tests of payloads uh, from last count at the, uh, from 2011 till the end of FY20. Uh, and that's through 12 active commercial providers. So highly encourage you to take advantage of those opportunities as well. To give you a sense of the kind of technology that's being developed through that, let's go, go ahead to the next slide. Um, this is an example from Honeybee Robotics, which is actually also a former SBIR company before it was acquired and became a large firm. This particular uh, technology um, that was tested under NASA Flight Opportunities is being infused into JAXA's MMX mission uh, as a NASA contributed payload. Uh, the, this particular sampler will capture regolith from the surface of Phobos. And in fact, that, that regolith may include Martian soil, which is pretty cool. Um, MMX is planned to launch in 2024 and return in 2028. So an example of a technology that was de-risked through a number of STMD programs, again, including the Freight Opportunities Program. Next slide. This particular um, example, the Vibration Isolation Program or platform um, uh, was also uh, selected for several SBIR awards, uh, awards, you might be noticing a theme, which led to selection for NASA's Deep Space Optical Communications or the D DSOC platform, um, which aims to develop and validate laser advances to dramatically improve communications between deep space missions and mission managers on Earth. Uh, DSOC is currently scheduled to uh, launch in 2022 aboard NASA's Psyche asteroid mission. So another example of how specific payloads and technologies get de-risked in order to enable future infusions or commercializations. Next slide. Flight opportunities, which we've just discussed, funds suborbital flight testing for many of the outcomes, but it can also validate testing and or hardware prior to an ISS flight, so orbital testing. 
Other opportunities for space environment or operational environment testing of payloads um, occur via the ISS. Uh, STMD's programs that I currently oversee, the Early Stage Innovation and Partnership Programs, don't generally facilitate the use of the ISS, but it does happen for some projects and is mostly PI driven. So some of those SBIR success stories I mentioned earlier that end up in ISS flights, those are very much things that are collaborative between the companies and the um, cores uh, that are working to advance those technologies, as well as with the ISS program, as they think about how to advance towards a flight opportunity on the ISS. That's not something like the SBIR program sets up for you. It is something that is PI driven, which is why I say, think about the end at the beginning. Always be thinking about the path that you, that you think that you wanna go down and have backup plans. Other STMD programs, however, like GCD, can take a more active approach um, in facilitating ISS demonstrations, and, and they do, which you'll see on the next slide. There are actually a number of STMD technologies on the ISS today, and a number of these actually have heritage in STRG, SBIR, and flight opportunities on their path to get to, uh, to become a project or a program in the game-changing development or technology demonstration mission program. I have two more slides, and then I'll close. Um, I, I've talked about opportunities for ground testing, for suborbital testing, for ISS, uh, ISS testing and payloads, but another really exciting opportunity for payloads in space is the Com Commercial Lunar Payload Service Activity, which is sponsored by the Science Mission Directorate uh, in support of NASA's science, human exploration, and technology goals. Um, master contracts have been awarded to 14 different vendors to safely integrate, accommodate, transport, and deliver NASA payloads using contractor-provided assets. Um, and these deliver, deliveries will be a mixture of science, technology, and exploration-related payloads. Uh, next slide. There are a few ways to pursue deliveries to the lunar surface that I want to highlight. PRISM is SMDs, the Science Mission Directorate's primary method for soliciting payloads for delivery to the moon, the eclipse. Um, and these instruments will feed manifests for task orders for deliveries from late 2023 onwards. So for SMD specific interests, looking at the PRISM solicitations is really important. But other mission directorates could utilize PRISM or their own solicitations um, to identify payloads to fly on, on CLIPS. And so for STMD, the places to look for that are NASA's Tipping Point Program, uh, the Luster Program, which is actually um, with the Space Tech Research Grant Program. It focuses on university involvement in the lunar surface uh, innovation um, activities. SBIR sequentials that I mentioned earlier, prize competitions with like the Honey Eye Shrunk the Payloads Challenge that I mentioned earlier, and even NIAC Phase 3s are potentially a way to think about um, getting an on-ramp to uh, the CLIPS program. So with that, I'll go to my last sl slide and I will say thank you guys for the time. I know that was a ton of information packed into 25 minutes, uh, but I hope it showed a variety of the different ways uh, that uh, universities, small businesses, individual innovators, and others can find paths to de-risking their technology and to flight ultimately on their way to uh, infusion or commercialization success. Thank you all for your time today. Well, Jen, thank you so much for that. That is great and fantastic. Uh, we've got several questions and I'll get to a couple of them here. Uh, first question, uh, could projects that participate in the challenges also turn into SBIR opportunities? Yeah, so we see that actually. Did Mastin tee that up? I don't know. I know Mastin no, has some role. Okay. No, they did not. Well, Mastin is a great example actually there. When Mastin was participating in the Lunar Lander Challenge back in the mid 2000s, um, they stated that at that time, their only customer was the NASA Centennial Challenges Program. And since then, they have participated through the SBIR program um, in, in, through many awards to advance and to de-risk a number of their component technologies um, since getting their, uh, getting their start with the NASA Centennial Challenges Program. So that's one example. That certainly happens. Great. Um, I'm going to take two questions and combine them into one, if, if you will allow me. One, uh, how can graduate and undergraduate students um, find partnerships for some of the research activities? And how can international students uh, potentially participate in these activities? Yeah, so prize competitions is one area that um, uh, generally there are a number of different prize competitions that are actually open globally. It very much depends on the terms of the prize. So you'll want to read the terms and conditions in each prize to see if it's open to international competitors. And also sometimes competitions are open to everybody, but the prize purse 
is only available to U.S. winners, and that's um, due to legal requirements in certain cases. And so you just want to pay attention to the fine print on prize competitions if you're an international um, student, but that's a great way to kind of get familiar with uh, finding ways to interact with NASA and solving challenging uh, problems. On undergraduate and graduate students, I would really, really encourage you to poke around on the STRG, the Space Technology Research Grant website, and see if there has been any awards to your university in the past, who those faculty are that have been awarded either early career faculty awards or early stage innovation awards, or other fellowships. We fund fellowships at both uh, at the master's and PhD level uh, for students to see if there are folks within uh, your university or alumni from university that have previously uh, participated to act as uh, mentors to you. But also that program, um, you know, is, is, is open to talking to interested proposers um, and would certainly recommend you uh, checking out the STRG website to understand different ways to navigate uh, thinking about applying to those programs. Great. And I'll ask one last question. We've got a couple more and we'll try to get answers to those and post them later up on the Ascend website. Uh, but the last one for right now is what problems or technologies do you see most likely to need uh, the research uh, and efforts from the universities and from the graduate students? Uh, what are the intractable problems that you most want solved? Yeah, so uh, the STRG program specifically, since this was asked about universities and small businesses, but also, as I mentioned before, the SBIR program has a university element. So with the with the STTR portion of the SBIR program, a small business has to partner uh, a large percentage with the university in order to uh, apply for the STTR program. And the STTR program actually has higher win rates for people that apply because it's harder to get a university partnership than it is to come alone as a small business. And so something to note for uh, looking for university partnerships uh, as, a, as a small business. But all of those solicitations that I just mentioned, at least annually release what kind of are the current hot topic problem statements that NASA sees as being uh, key areas for universities uh, in the early stage, in the early stages for us to be able to, to help explore or for those folks to help us explore. And so I actually think one of the richest, almost like data mining uh, uh, documents that exists from a problem definition statement perspective is the annual SBIR solution, solicitation. You can go back 10 years and look how specific subtopics have evolved, how the targets and the yardsticks for performance have changed and moved forward, how the agency is thinking differently about what parts of problems they want to solve. Uh, and, 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 and in some ways, it gives you kind of a historical story about the direction that certain technologies are evolving and the ways in which small businesses and universities can help advance those. Um, there are a number of different STRG solicitations on the street right now, too, that also identify high priority areas for university involvement. It's basically the waterfront. This could sound like, ah, she's not telling us any particular technology. Well, it's because we fund a lot of technology in the Space Technology Mission Directorate. Pretty much any technology that you could imagine that NASA would be interested in from a space perspective, it's part of STMD's portfolio in some way. And we try to be thoughtful about where we ask for university participation versus individual innovators versus small businesses versus universities. But we also make sure that we have opportunities for open solicitations that allow the best ideas to come in that aren't related to specific topics. So if you've got a really innovative early stage idea and it's not related to a particular problem statement, you can also check out the NIAC program, the NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts program that isn't actually tied to specific topics. It's looking at the most transformative concepts that could be transformative for mission architectures in the future, regardless of what the particular technology or topic is. So um, no, it's a lot to explore to understand the on-ramps to STMD, but that's part of the reason that I was delighted to be here with you all today to try to help make it a little bit more clear the ways that you could think about navigating working with NASA and technology. Well, thank you so much, Jen, for that very valuable insight. Uh, you've really helped us all understand things a lot better and open up the horizons. Uh, so in the interest of time, it's now time for us to move on to our next speaker, Dr. Alan Stern. Uh, Alan is a planetary scientist, a space program executive, an aerospace consultant, an author, and soon to be suborbital astronaut. Uh, as you'll hear, his career has solidified his expertise in space instrument development and payload systems. He leads NASA's New Horizons mission that successfully explored the Pluto system and is now exploring the Kuiper Belt. 
which is the farthest exploration in the history of humankind. NASA has selected Dr. Stern to fly as the first NASA-funded commercial space crew member aboard a Virgin Galactic suborbital space mission. The mission is expected to launch uh, next year. Since 2009, Allen has been an associate vice president and special assistant to the president at the Southwest Research Institute. Dr. Stern is a founder of Worldview, a near space ballooning company, and he serves as their chief science officer. Previously, Dr. Stern served as NASA's chief for all the space and earth science programs uh, with a $4.4 billion organization, 93 different flight missions, and a program of over 3,000 research grants. Before receiving his doctorate from the University of Colorado, Dr. Stern completed twin master's degrees in aerospace engineering and atmospheric sciences and two undergraduate degrees from the University of Texas. Dr. Stern is a recipient of numerous prestigious awards. He is a senior member of AIAA, as well as a fellow of the AAAS, the Royal Astronomical Society, the Explorers Club, and he is currently on the National Science Board. Dr. Stern has published over 330 technical papers, some through AIAA's electronic library known as Aerospace Research Center, Central, or ARC. His most recent book, Chasing New Horizons, is co-authored with David Grinspoon. The book gives us the up-close inside story of the epic first mission to Pluto. Dr. Stern has been listed twice as one of the most influential people in the world on the Time 100 list in 2007 and 2016. Just like before, we will answer many of your questions for Dr. Stern from the chat as we have time. So Alan, it's all yours. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Uh, Dan, for that wonderful introduction, and thanks to the AIAA, and particularly Rob Meyerson, uh, for inviting me to come and speak to all of you today. It's really an honor. Uh, and I also want to thank Jen for a really terrific presentation that set a high bar uh, for this uh, pair of seminars. So I'll jump right in now. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, some of my experience uh, in flying payloads and some of the lessons that I've learned that I'd like to communicate to you. Uh, about uh, how to maximize your payload success. That's a very broad topic and I had to really boil it down. And there were a lot of things that I wished I could have had time to speak about that I won't be able to, but maybe we can bring some of those aspects out as well uh, in the Q&A a little bit later. So with that, I'll take the first slide or the next slide rather. Uh, so this is the binary planet Pluto Sharon. And as Dan said, um, it's been my privilege to, uh, to lead the New Horizons team. Uh, over time, that's 2,500 men and women uh, to go do this farthest exploration of worlds. And of course, the purpose of that space flight is to bring a payload of eight scientific instruments out into the Kuiper Belt uh, to make the first exploration of the Pluto system and then Kuiper Belt objects, which we continue to do today. Uh, but my experience in payload development uh, is a little broader than that. Next slide. I've actually been involved in uh, a variety of different NASA planetary missions. Uh, this is New Horizons inside the launch fairing of its Atlas V booster uh, back in 2006. Uh, but I've also been involved in missions like the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter as a principal investigator in uh, the Rosetta mission, which is an ESA NASA mission. Uh, in which I was a principal investigator, and a variety of other missions uh, to Mars and Venus uh, and other targets in our solar system. And I want to tell you that uh, I would have never gotten there had I not been able to build a base of experience um, with somewhat closer to home payloads. Next slide, please. And so let me walk you through some of the things that I've had the privilege and been fortunate to be involved in. The first space flights that I ever took part of were NASA sounding rocket missions out of White Sands and Poker Flat, Alaska. Um, I was involved in 14 of those missions originally as an engineer, and then uh, graduated onto the science teams of some missions, and then I was principal investigator for seven. Uh, these missions spanned everything from uh, terrestrial auroral studies to studies of the planets with telescopes uh, to astrophysics. Next slide also was involved in four space shuttle missions in which I was principal investigator on imaging experiments 
uh, to study comets from the space shuttle. Next slide. You'll be able to see one of those experiments. It flew on uh, STS-85 and STS-93. It's called the Southwest Ultraviolet Imaging System. It's a telescope that fed an image intensified camera uh, to study uh, comets in the late 1990s. Next slide. I've also had a, a, a lot of experience flying airborne missions. Now these are not space missions, uh, but uh, they, they teach you a lot about uh, payload development, the scales of time that you have. The time scales are uh, much faster for this kind of development. And I spent the uh, better part of 10 years flying various experiments on different high-performance airborne platforms. Next slide. One of those platforms was down at Ellington Air Force Base, these WB-57s, in which we flew adjunct missions to uh, that space shuttle experiment uh, that I just showed you a few minutes ago uh, to also study the same comets in the infrared with me as the backseater and navigator, as well as the science uh, operator on the flight or these series of flights. And next slide. And then for a period of about four and a half years, I developed payloads for and flew them in a NASA Dryden, now NASA Armstrong, uh, F-18 Hornets uh, to do uh, airborne astronomy. Next slide. And the other type of aircraft experience that, uh, that I gained for payload development was on the NASA K-Bird and later on the commercial zero-G aircraft flying microgravity payloads, uh, such as this one here that studies planetary accretion. Okay, next slide again. As Dan said uh, a few minutes ago in my introduction, I'm privileged to lead a team of three scientists, myself and doctors Dan Durda and Kathy Olkin, um, who'll be flying on suborbital missions uh, beginning next year uh, to prove the efficacy of uh, various suborbital vehicles for doing research in the microgravity environment and also for doing the kind of things that we used to do on sounding rockets. Next slide. Our team was selected last year uh, to be, as Dan said, uh, the first uh, to fly on a commercial mission doing NASA science. That's one of the programs Jen was talking about under flight opportunities in STMD. Next slide. And we're in early stages of training for that, uh, for the high Gs, for the microgravity, for other aspects of the, uh, the missions that we'll be flying on. And I'd be happy to talk about any of these as we uh, get into the Q&A, but if I can have the next slide, I want to now turn to the second part of my talk uh, in which I'm going to discuss eight particular principles that I think are important to maximizing payload success. They're not the only things you need, but I think each of these is an important uh, uh, element of achieving success on a routine basis. And of course, whether you're an engineer or you're a scientist, um, you want to have as high a batting average as you can, uh, first so that you're selected for future experiments, uh, but also because you're after getting that data and turning all those ones and zeros into scientific knowledge. And if you don't get the data, uh, you can't do that. So the first principle I want to talk about is one that's probably familiar to most of you. Uh, we use it all across the aerospace spectrum. It's called test like you fly and fly like you test. And that means uh, uh, planning your test program to be as authentic as possible to reproduce not just the environments, but all of the aspects of the actual flight operation for your experiment that you can involve. And then when you go fly, stay within the boundaries of what you tested for to ensure that success. And let me give you one little uh, example of something that's, that might not occur to you. Uh, on the shuttle payloads that I flew, astronauts on board the shuttle, uh, mission specialists primarily, would operate our experiments. So in addition to testing those, those experiments in our laboratory and bringing them out in the field to conduct precursor observations ourselves, we also brought those astronaut operators uh, to our laboratory and then out in the field with us to practice with the equipment and to ask all the questions that might come up as they were working through their checklist while the uh, science team and the engineering team was there to help them and to answer their questions and even to modify our checklist where it was required. That's uh, the first element. Now let's move to the second one. 
Next slide. Attention to detail. This is very important. And we all know that spaceflight is very complicated and that spaceflight uh, offers many, many, many failure modes in which you won't get your objectives accomplished. But to my experience, uh, the only way to succeed is to have a team that's really vested in attention to detail, to every detail surrounding the development and test and operations of that experiment. And let me just say to those of you who may not be the best at that, because we we're all have our strengths and weaknesses. In fact, I'm not great at attention to detail. Um, so I took, I took my, my pains to go out and try to become better at that, to read about how to become better at that, to practice being better at that. But I also surrounded myself on my teams with people who were better than me at attention to detail. My strength tends to be in cross-cutting sort of systems engineering approaches um, and looking for, for gaps in, in uh, uh, the engineering or miscommunications between engineers. But uh, uh, I was able to solve my own uh, uh, shortfall in attention to detail by populating teams with people who are better than me at this aspect, which is really crucial. Next slide. Methodical organization, that's important too. Uh, spaceflight is about being organized and you should really develop methodologies so that you can become uh, organized in whatever aspect of a spaceflight hardware team that you're involved in so that, so that nothing drops through the cracks. And uh, I would recommend if you're not good at this now, go out and take some extracurricular courses. It'll help you with some skills that you can build to be more organized and put you through some practice sessions so that you're not doing on the job training with live flight hardware. The more organized that you can be at any level in a space flight project, the higher the probability of success for that project. Next slide. Well, I think we all know that space flight is a team sport. No space flight has ever been conducted by a single individual. And teams and teamwork are another crucial aspect of, of, uh, of payload success. It's very important that uh, as a team leader, that you build a strong team and that you make sure that your team has all of the elements, the skill sets that you need to carry the project out and where you can, the team members back each other up. But it's also very important that your team, team operate as a team with a single focus on success and looking out for one another uh, throughout the process from requirements development into design and testing and ultimately through your flight operations and then through lessons learned. At every stage, the team is, is crucial and the team working as a team is absolutely crucial. Next slide. Let's talk about clear communications. Um, it's my belief that virtually every failure in spaceflight ultimately comes down to some failure in communications um, within a project uh, or between projects in some cases. And whether that's you know, an example of, I didn't know you using metric because my part of this is being done in English units, or whether it's not understanding requirements, not asking the right questions, um, not uh, putting things in writing so that they're not just repeated over and over again, adding noise to the signal. Uh, whatever it might be, clear communications are completely central to payload success. And without clear communications, you, you multiply the number of failure modes. Let me encourage you in all of your projects to ask the people you're working with whether they understood what you said, whether it's a technical presentation or a written presentation. Um, ask for questions, ask people to think about it, um, uh, be accepting of questions, even when they're hard or they challenge you, because those drive out the failure modes. And uh, I also want to stress the value of written summaries of important uh, communications, so that again, they're written down and new people who come on the project can read them and not just hear about them and can, and can see them in their, uh, their full intent because they're written and those who want to review them after a period of time, because they want to make sure that they haven't left any part of it out, also crucial. 
And I know for a lot of us as engineers and scientists that we went into STEM careers because we didn't want to go into careers where there were more English classes, for example. But what I found, and I found it the hard way because I was one of those guys that made a fairly low English SAT score, is that I had to get good at, at both written and, and speaking communications. And I spent a lot of time working on that early in my career, still practice it today. And uh, I find it ironic, but most of the work that I do now at this stage of my career is about communications. Okay, next slide. Okay, okay let's talk about a, just a couple of last items. Uh, intelligent compromise. And here, the key is the word compromise. In every spaceflight uh, development of a payload, uh, you're going to find, or, and you, I'm sure many of you already realize this, that um, you're constrained by many engineering factors and programmatic factors. There's a schedule constraint. There's a, there's a budget constraint. Uh, there's, there's a constraint on, on uh, maybe your personnel and uh, how you share them with other projects if you can't afford to employ them full time. Uh, there are constraints of mass and power and many other things. And uh, what I found on every payload that I've ever been involved in is that we had to, had to um, accommodate those constraints ultimately by making some changes either to our requirements or our design or our tests uh, in order to, uh, to get it to the launch pad. The key, of course, to compromise is, is to do it intelligently. And I'll give you one example from New Horizons. Um, if you look at that cartoon of the spacecraft in the upper right, there's a black device. It's sort of cylindrical, almost looks like a hair curler, but it's not. Of course, it's a radioisotope thermoelectric, thermo thermoelectric generator, um, basically a nuclear battery. And they're very expensive. Uh, at the time that we built New Horizons in the early 2000s, uh, uh, those were $80 million a piece. And of course, the Voyagers and uh, Pioneers that went to the outer solar system before New Horizons flew two or even three of those devices to generate power. We had a um, uh, much tougher budget constraint. And as a result, um, I couldn't afford uh, two RTGs. And that meant a much lower power budget, which in turn made us compromise on our communication system uh, bit rates so that instead of being able to get all the data back after a flyby like at Pluto, in a, in a period of a few weeks, like Voyager back in the 1980s, it took New Horizons, built in the 21st century, a much longer period of time, 16 months to dump all the data, simply because we had to make a compromise on, because of budget, on our communication system for lower performance than we otherwise might have liked to. But as a result, we actually got it to the launch pad, got it built, stayed within budget, didn't get canceled, and uh, we're able to fly a spectacular mission for science. Next slide. This next to last uh, principle that I wanna speak about, solving problems early, is perhaps the most important of all of them. Uh, the earlier that you can solve a problem on a project, usually the greater degrees of freedom you have to solve it. You have more schedule, you have more funds, you have uh, more people oftentimes. And so it's, it's been my intent on projects to, to reward people for bringing us problems early. Never shoot the messenger, in fact, encourage the messenger, make an example of someone who spots a problem early and brings it forward so that other people see that they get the recognition for that, they get the kudos, maybe they get the bonuses or, or other things that are, that are meaningful in their career. Bringing problems forward early, in my view, is one of the most important skills that you can have, no matter what facet of payload development you're in. Now, that's different from causing problems. Um, it's really a good aspect of that clear communications. When people know there's a problem and they don't communicate it up or across the team, they can't get help. Um, the earlier that they can bring that problem forward and we can tackle it as a team to solve it, uh, the more likely that we're gonna get there without disrupting other parts of the project or seeing project failure. And that applies in flight as well as on the ground. And lastly, next slide, yeah. I wanna talk about pushing back. Um, sometimes you have to push back. 
sometimes there's not a way out of a problem except by pushing back, for example, on requirements uh, or on testing. Uh, and again, doing it intelligently, um, but by not simply accepting a situation that, that won't work for one reason or another. And uh, uh, whether that means going to your customer, maybe that's NASA, maybe that's another contractor if you're a sub, maybe it's to your boss, um, or maybe it's within your team, Sometimes you have to politely push back and say, look, uh, th this is an over-constrained problem and we need to tackle this together. If something's got to change in order to, to have a successful development or a successful flight mission. And my last slide is just a, a picture of the cover of that book that Dan brought up, Chasing New Horizons, which uh, uh, goes into a lot more detail than I've been able to in the last 20 minutes or so about these principles and others with real world stories of payload development problems and how we got our, ourselves um, out of those uh, alligator infested swamps sometimes. Let me say thanks again to AIAA for inviting me here and uh, thank, thank you to all of you for being a part of this um, as listeners. Uh, Dan, I'm ready for questions. Well, thank you, Alan. Uh, great, I, I can personally vouch for all those lessons learned and all of those great uh, principles so, right on the mark. Uh, one question um, from the audience is, what advice would you have for students looking to get into the space industry and specifically for working with payloads? What, uh, how would you advise the younger generation? Uh, I would advise you uh, uh, two ways right here off the bat. First, find what you like to do best. Um, what, which branch of engineering or science, or maybe it's not engineering or science, maybe it's, it's management, or maybe you're on the... the the, the cost and schedule side of projects. Whatever you like to do best is probably what you're gonna excel at the most and, uh, and uh, put yourself in a position to be working at the things that you like to do best uh, because that will maximize your chance of success. And at the same time, it maximizes you know, uh, uh, the fulfillment of your career. And then I would say as early as possible, begin getting experience with actual projects even if they're laboratory projects and not flight projects. And to the best extent that you can while you're still in school and in the early stages of your career, try out different things. Work on different kinds of flight hardware. Work on, on uh, uh, different kinds of, of uh, applications. Um, interact in, in teams in different ways by taking on different positions in them. The more quickly that you can get that broader experience, uh, the I think the more successful you will be. And you can do that through internships, through the classes you take, through the professors that you work for, through the AIAA, through other professional organizations, and through your, your, your choice of uh, positions um, after you finish school and you get out and you're in the working world. Okay, well, I'll ask one more question before you have to run, and that is, uh, what one story would you used to tell people from your experience to highlight uh, maybe some of those lessons you talked about? What, uh, do you have one favorite story you'd like to tell? Well, there's so many. Um, <laughs> I, I, would, I would just say, and I, I'm, gonna, I'm actually gonna talk about uh, um, a favorite story, but, but another principle that I didn't have time to talk about, and that is resilience. Um, uh, almost everybody I know that's in this business has had um, projects that, um, that failed on them whether it's their fault or somebody else's fault. I mean, the very first time that I was project scientist on a satellite, it blew up on the launch field. And we didn't get to do that mission because it was for a particular comet, which was, had come and gone, and we couldn't repeat it. Um, but a lot of projects, uh, and I think uh, uh, almost everybody in aerospace finds this, uh, a lot of projects get canceled before they get off the drawing board, or they don't make it all the way to the launch pad. Um, and you have to pick yourself up from that. You have to recognize that's it's never a desirable outcome and you wanna try and minimize that. You wanna work with great teams, experienced people. Um, you wanna accept projects that you think have a good chance of getting to, to fruition without too many miracles. Um, but um, having failures, whether they're day-to-day -day micro failures or they're actual payload or mission failures, failures to be realized or failures on the technical side to actually succeed is a part of it. And learning that it's, it's, it's something that you're just gonna run into that and you need to be 
uh, accepting of it. it you want to always uh, try to avoid failures. But uh, one of the things that I found, Dan, that, that um, young engineers often have a problem with is their very first fit significant failure. Whether it was their fault or somebody else's fault, the project didn't go to fruition, you know, um, and they put everything they had into it, and yet it didn't work. And that can be devastating. Um, I know it was for me, um, uh, a number of different payloads that, uh, that failed. Uh, the one that I spoke about where the, the, the launch vehicle was the, was the reason was also devastating. Um, but you've got to keep going if you love this business and if you love what you're doing. And uh, the trick is not to have um, all successes. It's to have uh, as high a batting average as you can, but to recognize that sometimes it's even beyond your own control and you're gonna run into setbacks. And uh, that resilience is, is another key aspect of being a good payload developer, payload manager, principal investigator, all those different aspects, even science team member. Well, thank you so much, Jen and Alan, for your great insights uh, for the audience and helping them accelerate uh, their payload investments. This has uh, been quite a informative uh, hour plus. We really do appreciate you taking the time. Now we'd like to turn the microphone uh, over to, uh, to, to Catherine Jones. I'm sorry, Catherine, I stumbled on that one. Uh, Catherine Jones from Maston, uh, a payload specialist at Maston Space Systems. Uh, we certainly wanna thank Maston for their great support uh, for, for the event today. Uh, and Catherine, if you can go ahead and share your screen and go through your Go through your story and we'll turn it over to you in the audience. So uh, again, thanks to Jen and Alan and uh, Catherine, all yours. Hi, everybody, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Wonderful. Yes, that was, um, that's quite the, to uh, follow up behind both uh, Jen and Alan, that's a lot of valuable information that, um, payloads could definitely use, especially starting off or even being experienced. Um, so I'm Catherine Jones. I am the uh, payload specialist for Mass and Space Systems. Uh, you can see my screen, correct? Yes, we can. Slide. Perfect, thank you. So yes, I work for uh, Mass and Space Systems out here in Mojave. Um, basically, we are accelerating the realization and impact of space ecosystems make sure oh there it goes so we have actually been around um for over a decade we've done 72 u.s missions and 23 international missions we are currently doing the clips 19c mission um also trying to incorporate as well commercial payloads not just uh nasa payloads so we have been, uh, for our future lunar ecosystem, we're enabling a sustainable utilization of the moon and beyond. We are wanting to uh, use reusable landers. We're working on landing pad technology. We also wanna look at terrestrial testing. And so we have a huge future ahead of us that we are, um, that are, we're shooting for. So we have quite a bit of satellite comms and everything else. So basically, what is Mastin? Mastin is a rocket company enabling a sustainable utilization of the moon, Mars, and beyond. Um, how we do this, we um, our unmatched flight experience, agility, and interactive approach allow, allows us to accelerate the realization and impact of space ecosystems. And we are aiming to unlock the value in space to benefit humans on Earth. We want to do this both via NASA and also commercial. So right now, Mass Emission 1, this is um, our uh, vertical landing, um, bleh, sorry, <laughs> this is our uh, vertical landing uh, lunar lander. So we are going to launch orbital uh, insertion. And then once we get into our trajectory, we can actually do correctional maneuvers. And then once we do our lunar orbit, then we actually can start our um, insertion and then our descent. And then we actually, uh, once we get into our braking and landing, we have an accuracy of 100 meters diameter of our initial landing zone. So um, providing full mission solutions to safely deliver lunar payloads. 
Um, basically, you'll start off with mass and packages for customer needs. Uh, we start with payload development, payload integration and testing, lunar delivery and logistics, surface operations. So these are all of our customer requirements. And we work both with the customer and uh, with our system based to work out, making sure our integration and surface operations are successful. Then we also um, work with our mission providers on uh, the payload developers, launch providers, satellite comms, and alternative solutions. We, our mission areas, we work on payload development, payload integration. We also can do terrestrial testing with our rockets here. We have a couple landing pads that we can actually vertically take off, vertically land, and do any testing that uh, people are looking for between that. Then we also work with our launch providers as well. And then we have flight operations, communications, lunar delivery. Uh, we can also do payload deployment and then surface operations as well. So for our XL1 lunar lander, the opportunity to deliver payloads on mass mission one and future missions, uh, currently for the 19C CLIPS project, we have um, we are working with eight payloads at the moment that we are on contract for. We have Heimdall camera system. We have a passive hardware, which is a laser retro reflector. We also have um, another payload that's doing infrared imaging system. We have uh, an energy transfer spectrometer. We also have a uh, lunar rover named Moon Ranger, who's actually going to basically go outside of our comms come and collect data, come back within our comms Wi-Fi range and collect data that we wouldn't be able to get due to they have the capability to rove on the, on the moon. And then we also have a spectrometer, actually quite a few spectrometers. We have another infrared uh, spectrometer, and then we also have a robotic arm that will do um, basically shifting in the lunar regolith with our own imaging. And then we are doing a, um, where a couple of payloads while the robotic arm shifts around in the regolith that other payloads are have their same uh, field of view. So everybody can actually uh, analyze all together. So there's a collaborative effort on that. Um, we have flexible payload mounting locations within our lander. We can go top deck, side deck, below deck. Um, we have solar panels that we actually modify to get the correct sunlight angle to make sure we keep power for the entire mission. Um, we use hypergolic propulsion engines, and then we have the X-band antennas for data downlink and command uplink. And then again, of course, our precision landing, the 100 meter diameter accuracy. We also have the capabilities of where as we're landing, we um, can assess to make sure that there is uh, the, the area that we're landing is clean and there's no obstacles in our way. And if there is an opportunity that says we didn't analyze a boulder in that spot, we can actually shift our landing to another location, basically our contingency plan. So I know we're about to do a um, q and A. I think I hit the three minutes. So a uh, great question for everybody. So typically everybody thinks of payloads as these giant massive military or NASA payloads. Um, they actually, payloads by definition can be anything say from seeds to biological samples, all the way up to robotic arms, large satellites, everything else. Um, there's a wide variety of even to uh, integrate payloads to a uh, design system or a sustained system. So uh, opportunities for undergrad students to the internships at Maston. How long does it take you to develop the mission you shared? Um, so we do have opportunities that I know we've worked with a couple of undergrad students and we have worked with universities before. I am not particular in all the uh, programs that we have because I have been mainly focusing on CLIPS 19C. Uh, we were awarded CLIPS 19C last year and we um, plan on launching in December of 2022 and landing. So basically it's going to be a two-year um, project. I hope that answered your question. 
Where can master deliver payloads? Okay, so for um, right now for XL1 that we have, we can actually um, deliver payloads into lunar orbit and on the surface and during trans out, transit to, um, I'm not quite sure about um, any earth orbiting, because actually I haven't been asked that question yet, but um, we can accommodate depending on what you're looking at during our transit time, our descent time, and also the surface. Apart from mass emission one, what other missions or projects in the company are you planning to pursue in the near future? Um, we actually do a lot of testing with our vertical landing and takeoff with our Zodiac uh, rocket with both military and uh, specific payloads. Um, we have an opportunity to do testing with GPS guidance capability. Um, we actually did the planet back uh, test on our Zodiac to um, make sure that they could get the correct section of the regolith and everything. Um, we have quite a few projects going on that incorporate um, both e-pumps. Um, basically, we if it's presented to us, we can actually potentially work with it. I haven't seen anything that we've actually turned away. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time and, and, and bearing with us here as we work through these technical difficulties. Uh, I, I think with that, uh, we, can, we can probably uh, end for now and thank everyone for participating. Um, Jen, Alan, and Dan for moderating and, and Catherine for, for providing that great insight into Mastin and, and supporting Ascend. Uh, this has been an Ascend event um, and please visit ascend.events, uh, the website to learn more about what's on the horizon or subscribe to our newly launched newsletter, which actually launched today. Uh, if you didn't get it this morning and would like to check out the stories in there, please send an email to ascend at AIAA.org. Uh, please have a great day, and we look forward to seeing uh, many of you at our next Ascend event. Thank you.